Welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Today is Friday, December 7th. Let's take a moment to pause in remembrance of Pearl Harbor Day as we are now uh, December 7th, 1941, I believe was the date. Taking a look at our space weather, our solar wind conditions are sitting at a 507.1 kilometers per second with a density of 7.7. .7. Solar wind is now increasing. We do have a small sunspot. Now, when this thing appeared, AR2729, we did get a small B-class flare. Other than that, um, this has been a pretty much a non-existent uh, sunspot. Looking at sunspot number 17, we have 203 days without sunspots in 2018. The TCI is up a little bit too at 38 billion watts. Taking a look at our KP indices, we're sitting at a 2 and our 24 hour max is at a 3. And if you take a look at the still image from the SDO, uh, it looks like we have a giant coronal hole. Uh, we are expecting solar wind from this around December 9th. So a um, couple days, that, I believe that's Sunday night, maybe early Monday morning. Take a look at spaceweatherlive.com. And let's take a look and see if we have any more developing news on our possible sunspot that we had talked about earlier last week. Actually, we haven't done a show since Monday, and I apologize, folks. Uh, Mari and myself have been a bit under the weather. And right now we have... Uh, sunspot coming through it's a problem uh people are saying they're catching an echo so i don't know let me just poke around here real quick no you don't have like a i don't think there's an echo i don't know maybe, there's only one mic on maybe it's april fool possibly you want trolls okay just kidding <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, it just makes you wonder sometimes when people say, hey, there's a problem, and then you like, you know, they disrupted the show, and good for you, um, but uh, do you hear a bit of an echo? That's fine. Yeah. All right. Again, trolls one, us zero. Good job. Okay, so we take a look at uh, the sunspot that we were watching earlier in the week, um, and I'll go to the SDO in motion. And by the way, this is not done yet. But Mari is uh, in the beginning stages of getting the new website almost patched up here. And I'll show you the difference here just in a second. There is that sunspot that I'm talking about. And let me see if I can get my handy dandy arrow right here. This is the active region that we've been watching uh, on the backside of the sun here for the past several days. And we're finally starting to see it come around on the eastern limb of the sun. And like it shows us here at Space Weather Live, it does appear to be uh, very active. Now, this thing was, I thought, anyway, there it is right there. I'll zoom in a little bit more. Uh, this thing I thought was a little bit more active, but has held it together. So it's possible we'll see another sunspot as AR2729 is making its way around the bend. Let's take a look at the TSI readings for November 27th, 2018. I'm sorry, that's November 29th, 2018. We're catching a reading of 1360.67. And I wanted to zoom out of this real quick. And, you know, there's so many things to talk about tonight. And I, I do apologize uh, about the vocals. I've experienced a little bit of uh, illness over the past several days. and um, But I wanted to get on and do a show tonight because there's a couple things I wanted to talk about. And I first wanted to mention the TSI. And I need to zoom this in a little bit, move it over. Because what I want to show you is the fluctuation and how minor it is, but yet it's there. And I'm talking about right here. We had a little bit of, of a lull in late 2017 in TSI, had a little bit of a jump as well in the very early stages of 18, but it's been on a steady decline since that time. So 
the reason why I wanted to bring this up is that it's very relevant when we're talking about heading into a minimum and where we actually are bottoming out right now and how way off the NOAA forecasters were with this current minimum. Mari showed me an excellent graph um, this morning talking about this paper here. Not that paper, this one. Center of Excellence in Space Sciences in India, Indian Institute of Science Education and Research. Um, I haven't had a time to go into all of this yet. But this is probably the third time that I've heard about the possible uh, Solar Cycle 25. And there's a lot of disagreement about this paper so far. Um, a lot of them think that we are going to be weaker than 24. And then here is the maximum sunspot for solar cycle 25 being predicted um, at 118 with a predicted range of 109 to 139. And a lot of folks uh, tend to disagree with that. And in my opinion, this paper represents what channels like us have said about getting another cycle before we hit the grand minimum. Um, I don't think that we're going to see any warming or any significant changes to what's happening right now because we still have a few more years of this minimum. And we continue to bottom out with sunspot activity right now. The sun is definitely getting quiet. Just how far she's going to go right now from solar cycle 24 to 25 is still unknown. But as we get closer and closer to solar cycle 25, we are starting to get a clearer picture of A, there is going to be a cycle 25. And that the likelihood of the grand minimum starting in 2030, 2031, is more likely than once thought. There's still talk out there that we could see 2041, 2042, 2043 being the beginning of the grand minimum. And at that point is when we expect decades without sunspot activity. So, I think the prediction... For the solar cycle 25 being slightly higher is, in my opinion, somewhat of a safeguard. Because if you look at previous cycles, in solar cycle 24, 23, and 22, since 22 we've seen the graphs of the cycles continuing to trend downward. So scientists out there believe that, you know, if it's going down, it's got to go back up at some point and then start going down again. But my, my thing is that we can see it in the TSI. And in my opinion, she's slow and steady right now. And if you compare it to this back here, look how long we flatlined. The last minimum. So this is only the beginning right now of this solar minimum and we're yet to get to the bottom just yet guys if you zoom out and look where we are compared to where we were again I, I, I'm not just regarding this paper I'm just saying that I don't think we should panic and like act like this is totally debunking the grand solar minimum because a lot of people out there still believe that this solar cycle is still going to bring extreme weather changes. The flooding, the earthquakes, the volcanoes, the, the snow bombs, flash floods, crop loss, that's all still going to happen throughout solar cycle 25. It's priming us for what's coming. I'll leave the link in the description for this paper. Let's take a look at some headlines. 
Severe flash floods sweep away cars. Rain described as heaviest in memory in Cyprus. This heavy rain started on December 3rd. Caused severe flash floods across Cyprus, claiming lives of at least four people. Locals described the rain as the heaviest in memory. The store is named Gaia by local meteorologists, has the potential to drop more than 50% of normal rain for the month of December before it's over. Flash flooding from an isolated downpour is not uncommon on the island, but sustained floods are rare, according to Reuters. Rivers burst their banks, causing damage, and as we see here, roadways. This is the aftermath after the flooding goes away and receipts. This is the mess is left for you to clean up. Unfortunately, four people have died by being swept away by floodwaters. <clears throat> now, what I don't get, I, it seems like every time we show flood footage, we've got cars trying to drive in this stuff. And then we read these awful headlines where people are losing their lives, being swept away from these flash floods that appear to be in somewhat uh, a, a manageable situation to drive through. But if you continue to drive and the water gets deeper and the current gets faster, there's nothing you can do. Your car becomes a floating device. So fortunately, these folks are safe, or we hope they are. Also, while we're on the topic, we were away this week. We missed a lot of headlines. Um, we started with the week with Alaska and the hundreds of aftershocks that we've experienced but we had a 7.2 in Alaska and then we see a 7.5 in New Caledonia tsunami waves were observed but nothing serious and the reason why I want to bring this up is to take a look at the earthquakes here in the last 30 days worldwide 4.0 or higher now the earthquake total for the month is around 3500 for the world at two point and higher but at 4.0 and higher we've had over 814 earthquakes and recently we've had the stronger ones November 30th was a 7.0 in southern Alaska 7.5 in the southeast loyalty islands the 18th of November was a 6.7, and then early on, 6.7 in November, but the rest of these are in mid-November, early December of 6.0 or higher. Eight hundred and fourteen earthquakes with a 4.0 magnitude or higher. Is this the series of earthquakes, the beginning? of what we're expecting to happen during the grand minimum? Is this the appetizer? I mean, we've seen tectonic activity increase over the past couple of years. But on the scale that we're dealing with right now, I don't care if these earthquakes are in the middle of nowhere. I watched a graphic the other day for Alaska and it shows a pin drop every time there was a earthquake aftershark of 2.0 or higher and it was unreal how many pins were dropping per second I mean Alaska literally has been carrying the world on its shoulders right now when it comes to earthquakes that in the new uh, Caledonia area I mean, this is a pretty big list for 30 days, 4.0 and higher. And volcanoes, 26 are erupting right now. Ish. I know Rob does a good job, keeps me up to date. Uh, there's a couple of earth. Uh, there's a couple of volcano. Oh, no, there it is, Symbiaca. But I'm updated on these volcanoes quite a bit, thanks to Rob, keeping me up to date. I've seen some uh, reports of 27,000 feet. Ash clouds, some a little higher, 30,000. I think one in the last two weeks in the 40,000 range. I'm not sure on which one. 
but this is all correlated to things because of what the sun's doing right now the coronal holes the solar wind the weak magnetosphere that we have right now how vulnerable our planet is to space weather at this time so this isn't a coincidence and I really am getting tired of seeing people who are trying to debunk this natural cycle that's occurring because that's where the disinformation becomes dangerous when you have people denying this you, know, you want to talk about climate deniers I, I can't it makes my blood boil when I see somebody on Twitter telling people that people who deny climate change are okay with lying to you that we're taking off bribes from big oil nobody here is a climate change denier but we are man-made climate change deniers no doubt obviously the climate's changing and that's why these cowards have changed the terminology from global warming to climate change so they could use that title in the narrative accusing the president and other people of being climate change deniers not once has president trump ever mentioned that he denied the climate was changing he just doesn't think it's man he thinks it's natural but yet every day i see a smart ass comment about how the president doesn't believe in climate change and that he is killing our planet and that how he is not considering the future of our children and civilizations to come that's farthest from the truth and this isn't about politics this isn't about supporting this guy or not these are facts we finally have somebody smart enough in office who's pumping the brakes on this whole global warming theory this man-made climate change that's all he's doing pumping the brakes he's making people put on their thinking caps Saudi Arabia Turkey Russia they're all getting ready to pull out of this Paris Treaty climate thing they're smart too especially Saudis I mean they see it firsthand the flash floods the the rain in the deserts so people are opening their eyes that's why they're pulling away from this this climate treaty and the you know the whole the France thing the carbon tax who knows what's really happening because the media is not covering it but I've seen a lot of people trying to jump on the other narrative that this is over a carbon tax others are saying that this is over something much deeper than that I think it's a mixture of both either way people are starting to get smart and nobody's denying science because everything that we're talking about is science based everything the climate the earthquakes volcano eruptions famine crop failure we show you the science on what happens and you know the reason why I believe in the global cooling versus the global warming is when I was introduced to space weather and that that's when it clicked when I was explained what space weather does to our planet and in, in various cycles and how it affects our oceans that was it that made sense to me how can man even if all their emissions the 5% emissions that controls the climate 95% ocean 5% is atmospheric even if man accounted for all 5% atmospheric how does that 5% outweigh the 95% there is no way that atmospheric conditions drive the climate co2 is not adding if anything it's cooling the co2 putting particulates in the atmosphere cloud nucleation cooler temperatures more tsi reflected back into space point blank not some garbage 
about you running your air conditioner extra this year because it was hot from global warming. And because you keep running your air conditioner, it's going to keep getting hotter. It has nothing to do with that. But enough of my rant. I just wanted to do a quick little update, little Grand Solar Minimum Science update. When we talk about earthquakes and the amount that we've seen and the frequency starting to uptick, you really starts you to make, you know, you start thinking about the book Upheaval. And I've been mentioning that a lot lately. And I really urge people to take a look at that book. I think you're going to be a little more prepared for what's to come. Seeing is believing, and we're putting it right in front of you. I don't think this is bias either. You can't fudge this. This is real information. And it's all been predicted. I wanted to show this off real quick because I know a lot of you will probably agree with me, but check this out. Tuesday, December 4th. Okay? The road's fixed. Look at that. I don't know how many of you live in a metro area where when the highway starts just redoing a lane, it takes three years to complete. And this earthquake damage that looks like something out of a movie was fixed and repaired in less than six days. How? I hope there's an engineer or somebody in the chat that could explain to me and my listeners how in the hell did that happen so fast when just painting lanes takes forever? Or adding a lane is a huge project. Now, I get it. It's not that long of a stretch of road, but, I mean, this looks pretty significant. I'm impressed. Thoroughly impressed. Bravo to the road engineers out there in Alaska. And they're working in the dark. Look at that. 9 a.m. There's no sunlight. So I thought this was an interesting picture. Um, to see this in real life must be a nightmare. And those of you who drove in rush hour traffic with the orange barrels, this is hard to imagine that this kind of a mess got cleaned up in less than a week. It's crazy. And speaking of crazy, <clears throat> we have uh, Winter Storm Diego moving across the country, and it started in California. I think it's important to mention that we were looking at historic rains and mudslides and mountain snow to Southern California on December 6th and the 7th. We're talking inches of rain in Los Angeles. 1.9 inches of rain on December 6th for Los Angeles, beating a previous record of 1.01 inches Set 1997. By the way, that was also during a minimum. This is not a coincidence. There's a pattern to this kind of um, weather. Cosmic ray influx happens during the minimums. Lower solar wind. Weaker magnetics between the sun and the Earth's magnetic field. The connection is weak. More space weather penetrates our atmosphere, creating more particles for water vapor to attach itself to. says here one person died in a vehicle overturn in the Sun Valley of Los Angeles, shutting down numerous lanes. Mudslide closed a 10-mile stretch of State Route 1 in both directions from western Malibu to the Ventura County line. California Department of Transportation said the closure occurred in the vicinity of last month's Woosley Fire and urged commuters to find other routes. So, we're experiencing heavy rains, flash flooding to areas that have seen fire. I mean, look at this. My God. 17th Street and Pomona Avenue. Please find an alternate route and stay away from that area, obviously. And yet you see cars that act like they actually want to approach this area and try to drive through it. Not a good idea. And folks, if you are making footage, please... Do it safely. 
I wouldn't even be comfortable driving in the waters this deep. I mean, this water is w reaching the water, the wheel wells of some of these cars. It's not going to take much more water. And, you know, in my opinion, this person's not very smart filming while driving. So he's got one hand to, to use on the steering wheel. When that water current gets a hold of you, there's nothing you can do. I don't even think two hands really matters either. But the link in the description, guys, there's damage from a mudslide. Weather Nation did a really good job, had some good footage of a very fast moving mudslide. And here we have people driving around the debris, large rock in the middle of the road. I mean, just nonstop for this area out here. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, they're trying to divert boulders from landing on the highway. So the fire department is now using water hose to apply pressure to possibly push these rocks away from the highway. Sorry, I got the headphones on there. Leave the link in the... That looks apocalyptic. My goodness. So, you got rain on one side of this, and then when you go into the mountains, <laughs> heavy mountain snow. And this is not just here in California, folks. But I'm not ready to talk about snow just yet. Keep it on the rain front. By the way, let's look at the radar. Texas is getting drilled. The Houston area is getting pounded right now. Heavy rain. Flash flooding. Some totals here in parts of Texas. 2.88 inches Deval High School in southeastern Travis County. 3.3 inches in Dry Creek. 2.86 in Colorado River near Weberville near eastern Travis County. And what I found interesting was the totals and the averages for Austin. Now, it looks like the rainiest part of the season is supposed to be May, June. Really, from January, it's normal to get 2.22 inches of rain or more until about, say, June. It's supposed to fall in that area of 2 inches per month. And starting in July... June, they were below 2 inches, but they got that back in July where their surplus was over 2 inches. August was dry. September was almost 3.5 times more rain than normal. October was twice as much rain as normal. November came up a little short. But still, right now we're in the surplus in the last 4 months. And for December, the normal is 2.4 and we're already sitting at 1.56 inches. And it's only the 7th. Thankfully after this storm there will be a slight break. We'll get into that here in a minute. But the temperatures from warm to cold for snow. Houston. 8 to 10 inches of rain is expected in certain spots. And we see it. There's your radar right now. There's where the heaviest of the rain is right now. Whoops. One of the arrow folks. This is where we're dealing with the 8 to 10 inches of rain. That is finally starting to move out. And head on track for the south. Now, all this rain talk in Texas leads me to this. Pecan farmers say rain hinders holiday harvest. The rain might be a welcome to uh, welcome visitor to relieve the drought and keep lake levels up in central Texas, but for one Texas staple, it presents a problem around the holidays. Rain hurts the pe uh, pecan harvest, and there is less of a variety this year because of it, and there's more rain in the forecast. So we've seen... This is not the first time we've had um, pecan damage because of heavy rains and winds. Remember Georgia from Hurricane Michael. Now the good news is, is that we're not seeing trees being uprooted. So this is not the kind of crop loss that's going to take 15 years for these guys to recover. But 
enough is enough. And, you know, poor North Carolina. This is the second state of emergency that's been issued in North Carolina in the last 90 days. The winter storm is headed towards North Carolina. could drop nine inches of snow and ice in the Charlotte area this weekend, according to the latest National Weather Service. Uh, Charlotte could see almost a, about 0.13 of an inch of an ice, according to the map. 4.30 on Friday, Governor Roy Cooper declared a state of an emergency for all 100 North Carolina counties. Parts of the state are forecasted to get up to 18 inches of snow and ice Saturday through Monday, along with gusty winds, Cooper said in a statement. Nearly all of the state is expected to feel some sort of impact from the storm. Cooper said at Friday morning news conference that he already activated emergency services, including the National Guard. The storm is likely to impact the most of the state with a mix of snow, ice, and heavy rain, freezing rain, and potential flooding. Cooper called a storm of this magnitude unusual for the state in December, and I agree with him on that. But, before I go any further, we were talking about, um, or I was talking about the other day, the old uh, Farmer's Almanac predicted that the South was going to be a winter battle zone. And what does that mean? And what they were explaining was that this region here, this year, they predicted ice, snow, and freezing rain in this particular region of the country this winter. Now, call it a fluke, but that's exactly what's happening right now because we're getting a mixed bag of every kind of precipitation from this storm. Freezing rain, ice, snow, heavy rain, leading to floods. Again, the old farmer's almanac was predicting this area to be the battle zone of the south for winter weather. All the way down here. And it's happening. So, uh, people like Noah, who predicted above average temperatures, below normal precipitation. I say bull honky on that. Let's go back to the Charlotte Observer. Cooper is warning North Carolinians that the cold temperatures could settle in after the initial rain and snow pass on Monday, creating treacherous roads for an extended period. Be prepared to stay put for a few days. When the storm rolls in, it looks like there will be a wide range of snowfall out there, he says. <clears throat> police chief is saying, if you don't have to be on the roads, please don't do it. Says 100% chance of heavy mixed precipitation is expected on Sunday in the Charlotte area starting just after midnight. Snowfall predictions for the weekend continue to be the highest north and west of Mecklenburg County, topping out at 16 inches. For Morgan, Morganson, Lenore, and Burnsville, according to the National Weather Service at 5 o'clock today. Hickory and Asheville could see 15 inches, Statesville 13, Lincolnton a foot, and Salisbury 11 inches, Gastonia 9, Monroe 4, and Rock Hill 2 inches. So as you can see, everybody's going to get some form of accumulation of snowfall. And then on Monday morning, we'll have snow and sleet at 8 o'clock during rush hour, from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. So that's something to take heed on, folks. After your weekend's over, you might want to make plans to get out just a little bit early and be prepared for slow-moving traffic. Now, the highest uh, ice accumulation is Spartanburg, South Carolina, where they're expected to get a quarter of an inch of ice. That can take down power lines. That can take down tree limbs. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're talking about power outages on top of cold temperatures. Not good. The bad weather is expected to begin as early as Saturday morning in the North Carolina mountains and Saturday night in South Carolina, Georgia mountains. The National Weather Service office in Greer tweeted at Friday, 4 p.m. Gives a little bit of information on what to do for winter weather safety. Again, North Carolina is not a wintertime state. 
especially in early December. At 3.45 p.m. Friday, the National Weather Service added that Charlotte and counties surrounding Mecklenburg to its winter storm warning that's scheduled to start at 7 p.m. on Saturday and will continue through uh, noon on Monday. So this one's going to be a long storm. Just a little bit of everything. So it's Friday night. You got the storm in 24 hours. Hopefully, most of you have already prepared for this. I'm sure locally you guys have been ready for this for the past couple of days. Stay home. Don't go anywhere. It's not worth it. Ice, snow, floods, rain, wind, treacherous roads. Yeah. Time to Netflix, binge, and wear your warmest pajamas that you have. And just stay home. Stay safe. Uh, it looks like you guys are in for a one-two punch for the next several days. I, you know I don't mean to rehash something I already covered, but this headline kind of hit me for a minute. Below freezing temperatures forecast for all 50 states, then snow. And that was as of December 3rd, 2018. When was the last time that we began a winter, not even winter yet, where all 50 states had been below freezing temperatures? Before the first day of winter. Food for thought. There's our current radar, our biggest newsmaker, Winter Storm Diego. He's making his way right now towards Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama. You're starting to see the beginning effects of this rain. We're dry everywhere else, thankfully. California needs a break. Northwest, you got a little bit of shower activity. Nothing too crazy. And I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but... The possibility of the Northeast looking at a white Christmas is very good. And once again, Tropical Tidbits failed me. This happens quite a bit. Let's see what I can get here. The reason why I say this about Christmas. Here's our storm right now, Diego. Heavy snow through North Carolina. I mean, they really do get the, the brunt of this. All right. Get a little break. High pressure dominates most of the United States on December 11th, Tuesday. We are dry almost everywhere. Some mountain snow showers in Nevada, Idaho, and Montana. We do have a big low pressure system entering on the northwest. And that will definitely take over by the 12th. As that will be our next focus on our next weather system. As it will travel across the four corner states into Oklahoma, Kansas, northern texas and kind of combined with the storm in front of it and join into this giant monster now this looks like an all rain event i know at first we thought we were going to get some birthday snow for mari but unfortunately it does look like temperatures will be warm enough for nothing but rain but my goodness uh quite a bit of rain and the bulk of it is going to be in eastern pennsylvania dc area north carolina watch out South Carolina, watch out. So the areas that are getting affected with this major winter storm is going to have to deal with a warm-up, but then possibility of heavy flooding as well. Behind that, another system moving in in the northwest. This system takes off to the Atlantic, and high pressure dominates for maybe less than a day as a messy system moves across northern California once again creating a very hazardous conditions for Northern California in the areas of the burn areas. Lots of snow to talk about here on the 19th. And as we looked towards Northeast Ohio, Western Pennsylvania, some snow showers. Here is the storm that I think that will <clears throat> not only bring us snow, but the temperature forecast, I believe, is predicted to get colder as we get closer to the new year. So we see December 20th, snow in Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, huge cold front dipping all the way into middle Florida. Friday, December 21st, big push from the Arctic. And there's a lot of snow with this system. Ohio, Virginia, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, western New York, most of New England, 
there's a good chance that when this storm is over, the temperatures will stay cold enough. And we see here on the 23rd indications of western PA, western New York, getting some more lake effect snow. With that being said, high pressure to dominate behind it, which will bring much colder Arctic air. And I believe that this snow will stick around for a couple more days, especially in the northeastern part of the United States, where we seem to stay in that cooling trend. Take a look at some temps. Let's go back to the beginning. Things are going to try to warm up here towards the middle of the month, especially in the northeast. Look right here. Now, that's not saying much. We're in the mid-30s, lower 40s. Cold air is fighting the area December 12th and filtrates in on the 13th. But yet that rain, that big low pressure of rain, look at all these temps in the 40s and 30s. So that warmth is enough to keep this low pressure system that I once thought was going to be some snow that weekend. It's definitely going to be an all rain event and something to watch. But as we get past December 15th, we start to see that cold Arctic air trying to push down into the United States as we get closer to that snowstorm. But look at that dip. We'll go back a little bit more. Here's that huge dip. We got more Arctic air showing its ugly head here in Canada, trying to make its way into the lower 48. And that warmth is fighting it. But we'll see how much of this warm air will actually win as far as the battle here going into January. And like I said, we're talking about January possibly being a pretty cold month for the Northeast and the Midwest, Northern Plains. North Atlantic, up and down. It's been trending up. It's kind of balancing out right now, staying at about 0.167 above baseline. El Nino is beginning to drop once again, 1.041 above baseline. Still in that weak phase, but look at this. This is what I wanted to look at. Notice the 26, 27, 26. Just curious to see how much farther these temperatures could drop in this region. A good friend of mine, uh, Starman, doesn't believe that we're going to see temperatures trending above one degree above baseline for very long. And I have to agree with him on that based on the information that we've seen. <clears throat> Arctic sea ice extent holding steady. 11.173 millions of square kilometers in the north. Yes, this is the time of year that ice grows. Yes, we did start out pretty low this year. But as you can see right now, we are not having any issues with ice. In fact, I'd like to look at last year's um, charts. Take a look at the North American snow cover anomalies. We're up quite a bit this year, folks. Look at that. These are the highest levels we've seen in North America for North. Look at for November. It's quite a bit. I see a trend. That snow total. It's going up. Kind of stayed put here for a little while. And that's during the 90s, late 80s. And then we really had a lack of snow between 04 and 08, right before the next minimum. The first minimum, 23 and 24. But boy, we skyrocketed. We, yeah, we had an off year, 2016. A little bit warmer that year in November. I remember that. But we have skyrocketed with North America snow cover. That's undeniable. But like I said, the temperatures have been cold enough, even with the atmospheric warming that we've seen in the Arctic. We are talking about some significant ice coverage right now. Exceeding these median lines by the way, whether they're monthly or yearly, they're still exceeding 
Hudson Bay is freezing over right now. Curious to see how much colder we get as time continues to tick down. Again, this is what the old website looked like. And Mari is in the process. And I think it's uh, looking pretty sexy if you ask me. A beautiful banner here of the cycles. 23, 24. We'll let you guys know when that's all complete and finished. Mari's still working on it, but I, I had to do a little sneak peek because I'm proud of her. She puts a lot of time in the website, the YouTube channel. She spends a lot of time on social media trying to help spread the word and get the truth out, which is all we try to do here at the Grand Solar Minimum. Mari, do you have anything you want to say tonight? Hold on a second. I got Mari coming up. How wonderful it is to spend time with you guys in the chat. Uh, everyone has uh, been giving us well wishes. They hear me coughing in the background and you. So, yeah, it's been a tough one to get over. A lot of new faces, a lot of people coming back to join us every night. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Tell you, I'm just going to keep it short because I feel like I'm losing my voice. <laughs> yeah, me as well. And, you know, maybe while I have my voice like this, I'll uh, I'll do a couple of movie trailers. <laughs> Take advantage of the deep voice while I can. All right, that's going to do it for us tonight, guys. We really appreciate you tuning in. The continued support of the Grand Solar Minimum channel and our website. We'll promise to have it done for you in the first of 2019 sometime. But with that being said, guys, we appreciate your support once again. Uh, we do plan to be on the air live Sunday night at 6 p.m. Again, we'll have a show. Actually, let's say 6.30 to be on the safe side. But we will rejoin you guys live 6.30 on Sunday. And hopefully, uh, health permitting, we get back to our regular routine. All right, guys, that's going to do it for us tonight. Thanks for tuning in, and we will talk soon.